Next, we have a, a very exciting session starting. And uh, David Willen, who is uh, our professor in practice, but also uh, ex-CTO at Boeing, uh, he'll be moderating, he'll be chairing the session. And the session will start with a very important talk, a keynote talk by Monisha Ghosh, who is the uh, CTO at FCC. So, uh, David, or maybe Monisha, you can just start. Um, thank you, Sujit, for the introduction. Let me just uh, share my screen. Monisha, let, let me actually introduce you properly. I, I think okay. I had a bigger uh, introduction plan for you. So, uh, go ahead. So, again, uh, I'm David Whalen, and, and welcome to the Spectrum Challenges, the Next Generation Wireless Systems, and the Need for Better Coexistence. Uh, so, we're joined today with a keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Monisha Ghosh. Uh, Monisha is serving as the CTO of the FCC, as uh, Sujet had mentioned. Uh, prior to that, she was at NSF in a rotating program director role uh, with the computer network systems. And uh, I think she played a role in starting the Spectrum Innovation Initiative, if I uh, think correctly there. Okay, and thank you for that. I think that's a wonderful next step. Um, she played a role in, uh, in her prior roles with the University of Chicago, along with uh, a joint appointment at Oregon National Labs, where she conducted research on wireless technologies, Internet of Things, 5G cellular, next generation Wi-Fi, and spectrum coexistence, the real challenge. Uh, in, uh, prior to the joining the University of Chicago, she worked at, uh, in, in industry and interdigital Phillips uh, research and also Bell Labs, uh, the famous Bell Labs. I, I spent time working with HRL, which I think was the West Coast competitor to Bell Labs. Uh, let's see, she also was appreciated for her IEEE work on uh, standards and, and was recognized as such. She's also a fellow of the IEEE. Uh, she received her PhD in electrical engineering from uh, USC. Uh, I'm UCLA, so that's our competing university <laughs> across town there. Uh, and she received her Bachelor in Technology from the Indian Institute of Technology. Uh, and I can't say the name properly, so forgive me. So I'll just say from India. So welcome, Monisha. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and it's not letting me share my screen for some reason. Okay, now I can. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, I've, I've attended in-person past, um, past forum events uh, at UCSD, and it's unfortunate, of course, that we can't all be together. Uh, they've always been very exciting, invigorating sessions with really nice speakers, uh, and of course, the interactions. So what I'd, I know we're running a bit late, so what I will do is um, talk a little bit about one of the challenges that uh, I face as in my role at the FCC, as well as uh, some of the research I've been doing in this area. So I will be wearing both hats. Um, the first part of the presentation, I'll talk a little bit about what FCC is doing with Spectrum for next generation wireless. And in the second part, I'll talk about some very recent work that we've been doing to really understand uh, what, what Spectrum coexistence needs are. Uh, the views that I will express in this presentation are mine. Uh, they don't necessarily represent the views of the FCC, so please take whatever I say in that context. Uh, so, as I mentioned, I'll just quickly run through some recent spectrum allocations. Uh, and there's been a lot happening in spectrum recently at the FCC, as uh, those of you who might be keeping track may have noticed. Uh, then I will talk a little bit about some of the lessons that we've learned from our own research. Uh, and then I will just, you know, uh, pontificate on what I think, where the future of spectrum uh, should be going. You know, what 6G is, where does 6 gigahertz fit into it, uh, does terahertz have a role? Uh, and then th that will lead us into the panel discussion after that. So no talk in spectrum can be complete without this chart, which I'm sure all of you have seen. Uh, I don't want to dwell on this too much, except of course, to point out the obvious uh, that our system of command and control uh, has left us with these little tiny slivers of spectrum that are constantly jostling against each other, trying to make space uh, for whatever is out there. So trying to find space for new applications, new networks, the next generation is always a challenge. Uh, and over time, we've gone up in spectrum. Right now, we are in the 
uh, tens of gigahertz to the hundreds of gigahertz. And yes, there is a lot of spectrum out there. You can get the wider bandwidths. Uh, but as we all know, the propagation challenges are, can be very limiting. Uh, and also, we always we, we tend to forget that there there may not be a lot of commercial services um, in the high hundreds of gigahertz. Uh, but there is a lot of science that's happening there. There's lots of uh, deep space observation um, and other um, uh, passive sensing that need to be protected. So. Just because we're going high in spectrum doesn't mean that the spectrum comes for free. There's always a give and take. So FCC has had what's called a 5G fast plan, which has facilitated America's superiority in 5G technology for a while now. Uh, and this is a fairly comprehensive strategy to look at the entire spectrum band and to allocate sufficient spectrum everywhere. So that includes the high band, which is above 24 gigahertz. Uh, which is particularly suitable for small cell deployments uh, using 5G millimeter wave. That is where you're really going to get the gigabits per second throughput uh, because of the wider bandwidths that are available. Mid-band continues to be probably the spectrum that is most coveted um, and will always have a space. Physics has not changed no matter what we've been able to do with our bits and bytes. Uh, the physics of propagation just want us to use that band uh, for balancing coverage with throughput. And of course, that is also the most crowded, the most challenging. Low band is still has a, a place to play. Um, the, it gives you the much wider area coverage. Uh, there are carriers out there like uh, T-Mobile who are planning to roll out 5G just using low band. Uh, you will get a lower throughput uh, if you just use that low band spectrum. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, for applications like rural deployments, coverage in uh, <clears throat> long distances, uh, you really can't beat low band. Uh, there's also the other piece of the pie that the cellular industry has begun to take notice of uh, a lot in recent years, which is unlicensed. Uh, unlicensed has always been the provenance of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and all these devices that are constantly, that, they, that they're not scheduled, they're not controlled. Um, there were all these dire predictions that this was going to be a tragedy of the commons. It hasn't happened, right? Uh, I, I would wager that, you know, most of us are dialing into this conference uh, using some kind of a Wi-Fi connection in our home or offices. Um, and there is, it's become increasingly clear that in order to enable the expansion of Wi-Fi, more unlicensed spectrum needs to be made available. Uh, and as we've seen with LAA and 5G, we also fully expect that 5G and future cellular will deploy an unlicensed spectrum. Um, just a quick overview of what we've done recently at 24 gigahertz. There have been a number of auctions that have been completed over the last year and a year and a half. At the end of which the US has about almost five gigahertz of spectrum allocated. This is, uh, US does lead the world in high band. Um, and uh, I, I was listening to some of the earlier talks and there's, I seem to sense some kind of skepticism of millimeter wave. Um, I'll, I'll talk very briefly later on about some measurements we've been doing in the Chicago area where I personally as a skeptic have been pleasantly surprised as to what millimeter wave can develop, can, can deliver. Yes, it needs work. Um, but I think as a country, we are, we are leading, we're out there uh, leading the rest of the world, which is more focused on mid-band 5G. Um, the mid-band, as I said, is where we really want to make more spectrum available, but is the hardest. Uh, I'll start with two and a half gigahertz. This is actually a band of spectrum, which is the single largest contiguous block of spectrum below three. It's already allocated right now to what's called the educational broadcast service and a broadband radio service. Uh, there are a lot of tribal lands that have licenses there. Uh, and the FCC has been engaged in an effort over the last year or so to reevaluate the spectrum. By the way, that is, that is something we do at the FCC all the time. Uh, uh, just because those slivers that you saw in that, uh, in that chart uh, are there does not mean that we don't go back and look at uh, you know, whether we've allocated a service which is not really being very useful and should we do something different. So this is a band that we are looking at right now. We hope to be able to move forward on making some um, spectrum available for auction there next year. The C-band report in order, that took a while. Uh, however, that's happened. The auctions should start next month. Uh, that is about 280 megahertz of spectrum. 
Uh, of course, uh, there were there was stuff in there. The satellites were in there. They had to be moved out. That takes time. That takes money. Um, and 200 megahertz um, will continue be to be reserved for satellites in the upper part, uh, 3.98 to 4.2. And I think one of the things to note with the mid-band story, as you will see in all of these other bullets that are out here, the CBRS and sharing, is that there really are two, op two options that you have for, uh, for allocating mid-band spectrum. One is either you take something that's already there and you move it out, which is what C-band is, um, or you figure out a way to share it, which is what we did in CBRS. Um, this took a long time. It took, I think, you know, a fair number of years to sort out um, how the protection would work using SAS, the spectrum access system, uh, along with environmental sensing, the ability to have different tiers of service, um, and then the auctions for the highest tier, which are the priority access licenses, uh, that just concluded in August, um, and it raised 4.5 billion. There were many bidders. Of course, you had the conventional mobile operators bidding. But what is interesting is you also had a lot of smaller bidders because some of the applications that have been mentioned, like industrial IoT, industrial control, these may, may need private networks. And in the US, at least, uh, we don't really have spectrum set aside for private networks. So it's either federal um, or you have commercial uh, 5G networks, right? Uh, you, in, the, in Europe too, there is a discussion beginning to happen about should spectrum be set aside purely for the use of um, private, um, private um, applications. Uh, we just also released a notice uh, about potential sharing in the band just below this band. Uh, which would be 3.45 to 3.55. Again, this is not a clean band. There are radars there, just like in CBRS. Uh, we hope that we can do something different here, that we will not require the very intensive sharing mechanism that we developed in CBRS. Uh, the NTIA, which is the agency that regulates federal spectrum, has worked with the FCC to come up with some, uh, some ideas. Uh, but again, this is this is an open proceeding, um, and there is comments uh, welcomed from industry and all interested players. I will not talk about low band because yes, it has a space, but there's not a lot of interesting things that we are doing there. Uh, unlicensed, the biggest action that we did made this year uh, was make 1.2 gigahertz of spectrum available for unlicensed use. This is the biggest chunk of spectrum that has been made available in a long, long time. However, Again, this is not shared, uh, this is not clean. Um, it will be shared with existing incumbents. So again, over here, obviously on licensed spectrum, nobody has priority to it, but in this spectrum, these guys do. Six gigahertz fixed links, which already exist there, are the incumbents that have to be protected. There's also broadcast auxiliary services. So these are the news gathering trucks that show up when there's a breaking event happening and they use the spectrum for their uh, radio back cameras to transmit the video that they are and the footage that they are uh, capturing to back to the television broadcast uh, stations. So, and the six gigahertz fixed links, a lot of them uh, are mission critical. They are, uh, for example, there are carriers out there that use it to control your energy grids. So these are not applications that um, we can say, you know, they're not that important. We don't need to protect them. We do. And the rules that we've developed in this proceeding, uh, we've spent an inordinate amount of time to make sure that the power levels that we've come up with will protect these incumbents. So right now, our rules permit a low power indoor operation, whether it's mostly going to be Wi-Fi, but it could be any, any unlicensed uh, device. We, and this uh, low power indoor does not require an automatic frequency control or AFC. Uh, we've also authorized higher power outdoors, but those will operate under an AFC, which is basically a database that has the locations and coverage areas of these fixed links, uh, and they will figure out uh, exclusion zones or coordination zones that unlicensed devices can use uh, uh, if they want to use that with the higher power. We are also right now investigating um, the FNPRM as the future, the further notice of proposed rulemaking. We are investigating how we can authorize very low power devices. So these would be devices that could be anywhere, not necessarily indoors. They, they could be outdoors. So by definition, they pose a much higher interference risk to the incumbents. 
Uh, and so we have to really understand uh, what that capability is and how to protect. And of course, what we hope will happen in this band is more Wi-Fi, more unlicensed cellular, uh, and of course, applications that we've not dreamt of yet. We're also looking right now at repurposing the lower 45 megahertz of the DSRC band uh, for unlicensed use. This would add on to what we already have in five gigahertz Wi-Fi to make a bigger, uh, bigger band available for Wi-Fi. Uh, hey, Manish. Yeah. Manish, sorry, this is Deshaun, the, moder the Zoom moderator. Um, we mm -hmm. are at your time, um, but I do see that you all are scheduled for session three. Mm -hmm. So imagine. yeah, I will. I will. Yeah, I, I I did start quite a bit late. So uh, I hope I will get a few more minutes uh, to finish up. Uh, I think I started on. Yes, uh, let's give Monisha. Let's give Monisha a few more minutes. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Sajid. So uh, now I will, and again, you know, um, I don't think I'll have time to go through this in detail. So if anybody has questions or, want, or wants to discuss it further, please reach out to me separately. So I, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing to study coexistence. Uh, in the past, we did this like any other academic, and this was before I came to FCC or NSF. We did the standard analysis simulations and very limited SDR experiments. And through that, we actually had two main takeaways that, that to, to really allow these very dissimilar systems like Wi-Fi and LAA to coexist, uh, they have to treat each other symmetrically. You know, just like humans, people coexist better when you treat everybody the same. Same thing with systems that are trying to coexist with the unlicensed band. And we came up with levels that we felt were good protective levels. But more importantly, what we found through extensive studies is that we tend to think about coexistence and interference only in terms of RF levels. What we understood is that it's much, much more. MAC protocols, uh, how uh, these systems operate. And you know, for people uh, in this group who work with Wi-Fi, we know that we have a problem, the hidden node problem. There've been well-defined methods using things like RTS, CTS to solve those. Those don't work when one of the hidden nodes is an LAA base station that does not recognize your messaging. So how do you go past this hurdle of your MAC protocols that cannot understand each other is, I think, one a, a severe problem that we have to overcome if we want to uh, coexist more fairly. So what we switched to doing about maybe a less than a year, a year or so ago, is we started noticing that LAA is being deployed rapidly in the Chicago area. I don't know about other metro areas, but in Chicago it is. And students suddenly noticed that every lamp hole in downtown had an LAA based station on it. So we tried to figure out how can we understand coexistence is the, in the field. And obviously, you know, as academics, you don't have huge, you know, you don't, we don't have the equipment that carriers do. So we looked to our phones. Our phones are actually the best sensors, very powerful sensors, in fact. And we looked at apps on phones to extract all of the uh, data that your Wi-Fi chip or your cellular chip is, is capturing, you know, the RSSI, the RSRP, how many resource blocks are being allocated to you if you're in a cellular network, uh, what is the MCS you're using, how many streams you're using, all that information is there in your phone and you can pull it out today using apps. So we used it to cover very to, to make very detailed coverage maps, and we could really hone in into areas where we thought coexistence was a problem. Um, and again, I won't go into the details. We used a bunch of different kind of apps and different phones. Um, and then uh, uh, what I will jump to is an experiment. So remember, this is deployed infrastructure, right? We can't control it. We cannot control the behavior of all of these base stations and Wi-Fi access points. The one thing we did observe is that whenever we'd be connected to an LAA base station, our phone was the only one that was getting connected because all the resource blocks would be allocated to us. So we kind of leveraged that to do some experiments. And uh, I don't have time to go into the details of the experiments. We just recently had a paper uh, accepted in uh, Wireless Communication Magazine, which should be out shortly, that has all the details. But suffice it to say, what we were able to do is we were able to do this fairness um, experiment where can we see what effect an LAA base station has on Wi-Fi performance? Um, again, let me, so let me just jump to this curve. The first thing that really surprised us because we weren't expecting it, uh, I don't know why, but we should have, 
is that LAA is aggregating three unlicensed channels. All of the work that we've done and most of the work that academics are doing are kind of assuming that LAA is on this 120 megahertz channel that Wi-Fi is also using. We go up there and we see, nope, it's aggregating over three unlicensed channels. So that get, gives them a huge boost in throughput compared to what they can get on the license, which is the purple bar. The other thing we, we realized, which is actually very smart, is that if we are doing streaming, so the S stands for streaming traffic, the streaming traffic is almost never transmitted over unlicensed. And that makes perfect sense because you're going over unlicensed, you don't have control of a QoS, so you want to keep your streaming traffic going over, uh, over licensed. What we also uh, saw is that the average delay of Wi-Fi really suffered once you started having um, uh, Wi-Fi coexisting with LAA, which is this green curve. And we knew that that was happening because when we looked at what happened when streaming traffic was being uh, used to test performance, we didn't see that difference. And that goes back to here where you see that, yeah, in the streaming traffic, LA is not being used. And so Wi-Fi has a precedence on this. But the message that I want to give away from here is not that I don't think LA should be using the unlicensed spectrum. I think it absolutely should. It's just that we have a lot more work to do in trying to figure out how best to do this without adversely affecting one system. Um, the next, uh, I also want to go a little bit into our recent work that we've been doing in measuring millimeter wave. Now, you see these bars over here? That is what millimeter wave 5G gives you, close to one and a half gigabits per second. We've actually seen one and a half gigabits per second. What you also see is you don't get it everywhere because it's brittle. So there are locations where you're shadowed, where you're far away from where the base station is and you don't get it. And in those locations, if you see the red bar, which is 4G plus LAA, you're actually very good. So this brings up the whole question about how we should think about deployments going forward. It is not an either or. It is not just millimeter wave 5G or mid-band 5G. You have unlicensed, you have licensed, you have millimeter wave. And the challenge, I think, as a community for us is to figure out how to make it so that we have much better performance everywhere. Um, again, in the interest of time, um, I can make these slides available. We've done a lot of measurements trying to really understand where millimeter wave fits in into this whole ecosystem. And I'll <laughs> just show you the curve. And, and my, my gut feeling right now is looking at what we've done and looking at what the industry is doing is that mid-band 5G can get you a little bit better than mid-band 4G. It's not going to, it's not a paradigm shift there. If you really want this, this paradigm shift of throughput, you have to go to millimeter wave. And so the question is, how should you think about wireless and mid-band? Should it just be 5G, a combination of 4G and LAA today, and a combination of 5G and RU in six gigahertz and 4G and 5G? So the number of building blocks that we have at our disposal are much bigger. And we should really start thinking about them that way rather than the separate systems that we optimize to work uh, best in their own uh, situations. So just some closing thoughts, which we can probably explore more in the panel coming up is, again, these are my impressions that looking at what's going on with 4G and LAA uh, and the amount of spectrum that unlicensed will have in the mid band, it seems to me a no brainer that 5G and RU will, will just have to be implemented and will make 5G in the mid-band much better. However, and this is a call out to, I know the companies on this in this group and others, is that even today, these two standardization bodies, they pursue independent activities and they design their systems with some very limited liaison activities, but I feel they should be much stronger. You have to start looking at integration of uh, unlicensed spectrum into cellular network and vice versa in a very holistic manner has to happen from the very beginning, not as an afterthought. Uh, because the bottom line is that sharing is here to stay. It's going to become an increasing part of our spectrum future. And unlike systems have to start designing to this reality. Manisha, that was a wonderful talk and got, got our session started off nicely. Thank you. And you'll be joining us as, as a panelist as well. So please stick around here. Uh, and also, I would tell everyone online, if you have some questions for Nisha, uh, please enter into the chat window and we'll try to use those uh, after, after we, we hear from all our speakers. 